Good morning, and thank you all for coming out so early in the morning. This morning's session focuses on the architecture and urbanism of Shanghai between the two world wars, a period of rapid development when the city of Shanghai acquired its unique identity, its urban forms, and ways of living as a modern city. My artifact, since we all have to have an artifact, is the form of the city itself. I will describe the development of Shanghai and the contribution of the Lilong or alleyway house compounds to the unique legibility of Shanghai. By legibility, I mean, how do people read and understand where they are in the city? How do they navigate? How do they find their way through the city? And how's the city structured to support a variety of activities? Essentially, I'll be describing the morphology of the city. I'll end my talk, I know we're in a narrow period, but I'm gonna end my talk with my concerns for urbanism as Shanghai continues to transform from modern to global city. In the following quick history of Shanghai, I'd like to focus on a set of questions. What is the form of urbanism in Shanghai? What are the ways in which experiences and patterns of everyday life are held in the city? And I'll explore these questions at a variety of scales, in the room size, in the neighborhood size, district-wide, and at the scale of the city. And I know that there's a few of you in the audience that are also architects and urban designers like I am. And my goal is to look at the city so that I draw lessons and teach lessons on how to design and build better cities. In the, in the following very quick history, my underlying proposition is that Shanghai is a water city. Um, and this understanding is key to understanding the city's urban growth. As we all know, Shanghai sits on the eastern edge of the Yangtze River Delta. I know many of you have traveled outside of Shanghai proper and will recognize this landscape. It's the lower reach of the Yangtze River. In this map, you can see the low-lying plains of the delta. The darkest tone is sea level, and each shade lighter is a meter increase in height. Much of the land area around Shanghai is around sea level, and in some cases, even below sea level. As a result, these lands are exceptionally prone to flooding, as well as silting. The Delta region has a very contrary ecology where rivers frequently change course and waterways that were created then get silted up. Uh, to locate you, this is an image of contemporary Shanghai and what I wanted to show, find, there's the laser, the Huangpu River to the Yangtze and then the Suzhou Creek that's running in this direction. The Suzhou Creek, earlier known as the Sungjiang River, was the major waterway to Suzhou. Suzhou sat at the intersection of the Suzhou Creek and the Grand Canal. There's the Grand Canal from Beijing to Hangzhou, and then the Sungjiang River, the Suzhou Creek. Uh, that location allowed Suzhou to become um, a major pre-industrial center in the inland port. At this point, Shanghai was only one of several Yangtze uh, Delta port cities. During the Tang Dynasty, the Qinglong was the major town along the Suzhou Creek. But in the ebb and flow of the Delta, the Suzhou Creek began to silt and it shrank. And then commercial traffic instead increased on the Huangpu River. So the, the Songjiang is decreasing and the Huangpu is increasing. Uh, and I think that Shanghai's unique location at the intersection of both rivers um, allowed the city to benefit as one river grew and the other one ebbed. Shanghai was officially uh, designated a market town in 1074 and in 1159 it was promoted to a market city. In 1404 a new channel was excavated, you can see it right up here, north to the Yangtze River which prevented the backwashing of sand. The flow of both rivers put together helped to keep the new common channel scoured, resulting in stabilizing both water courses for the next 400 years. So here's an early map of Shanghai, the Suzhou Creek still on the top, the Huangpu over here. And note the flow of the water from the west to the east. The water flow is the major continuity and structure of the emerging settlements. 
Shanghai continues to grow, fueled by the introdu introduction of cotton and the corresponding textile industry. The townspeople in the Delta were plagued by um, piracy, and so they built walled cities that are in the form of ovals, uh, like many of the late Ming towns. This is in distinction to the administrative cities that we know that are very rectilinear and work relative to cardinal points. Here's the city of Shanghai, and still you can note that it is organized and defined by its waterways. The inner city became increasingly dense. Growth moved outside the walls, mostly between the city and the Huangpu River, right in this area here. In 1843, the British arrived to do business in Shanghai. As a result of the Treaty of Nanjing, Shanghai became one of five ports open to European trade. And while the British authorities set up administrative offices inside the walled city, their ships were moored here along the Huangpu and the trading was occurring uh, beside their anchorage. What you can see in this 1862 plan is that the land of, there's a land development model of a open grid this is just the racetrack here, and uh, uh, speculative land development. Also, you can see the main towpaths along the canals that run again in the west to east direction. Uh, I'm gonna leave this up to, for Jeffrey to talk about more, an image of the bun. The arrival of foreigners increased in the early 20th century with an increasing size and development of the different concessions. Here you can see the French and American that are growing still along the waterway, along the Huangpu and along the Suzhou Creek. And by 1926, we can see in the map how rapidly the city has expanded inland. One of the most noticeable changes uh, for an urban designer is to see the increase in the size of the blocks uh, in, in this development over what was going on in the British concession. And I'll come back to talk about this as I move into the discussion about the Li Long. We can now see that the canals are infilled and the tow roads have become the major roads of the city. For example, Nanjing Road, what is today called Hai Hai Road. Along the major roads, the hotels, department stores, banks, offices uh, line the streets. And behind the facades of these grand buildings and local shops, uh, speculate, speculators were building a form of mass housing known by two names as the Shikamun houses or as the Li Long housing. In the late 19th century, uh, in the late 19th century, an influx of Chinese uh, fleeing the Taipings in Nanjing sought protection sh in Shanghai, using its position as a treaty port as security. Taking economic advantage of the resulting housing shortage, European and later Chinese landowners developed a speculative mass housing based on a unit prototype arrayed, arrayed along alleys within larger neighborhood compounds. The Lilong compound was bounded on all sides. Literally, it contained, was contained within walls that separated one compound from the next within a block. And it was screened by shop houses or modified chikamun houses along the street edges. This perimeter of buildings and their lower, lower level shops shielded the daily life within the Li Long from public view. In, in this plan, you can see two variations of the early Shikamun house. There's a five bay, which is along this edge right here, and a three bay house. Developing the Li Long proved to be a highly profitable and in, inexpensive, low rise and dense urban fabric. In this complex of which only the eastern half today remains and Last time I was there, it was scheduled for demolition. Um, this complex holds nearly 600 people per square acre. The structure is easily expandable. The pattern can easily grow in the east-west direction by just adding another unit, and grow in the north-south direction by adding another row of houses. Uh, this paralleled the corresponding large block structure that I pointed out earlier in Shanghai. This is an aerial from 2007, and you can still see how much of this small, dense fabric covered Shanghai. Um, by the end of the 1940s, in the span of about some 70 years, 72% of Shanghai was covered with a Li Long fabric. 
So even the one, this is uh, an example from that last set of compounds I showed you. This is a one bay wide uh, Schuckerman house. And I will argue that they, it also shares characteristics with the traditional Suhuyuan. Uh, it has an entry court, shown here in yellow, as a central activity area, although it's now shifted from the courtyard into a central ground living area. In the Suhuyuan, the next set of rooms typically held um, receiving and sleeping activities. In the Shikuman house, that next zone, you have to move into a stair and then up to the upper levels. And then finally, there's a service zone. Um, and so you're organized moving from the south into the north of the house. The houses and the alleys were almost immediately overcrowded. With the scarcity of housing, the intended single family use of the Shikamun houses was almost immediately obsolete. Rooms were rented to other families who then subdivided and sublet yet again to others. Uh, so this particular unit, you've got to remember, it's only one bay wide, so it's about some 14 feet wide, but it's got a floor height that's 17 feet tall, um, floor to floor height that's 17 feet. So the front room was also very deep. Very quickly, it was subdivided into a front room and a back room. It had lofts that were installed. The upper level was subdivided in the same way with a front bedroom, back bedroom, and a loft above. Could be pointing at it right up here. And then quick additions were made where the person living in the front room extended into the courtyard and the service areas were also occupied and covered. So what was intended to be a well-lit, well-ventilated house immediately became overcrowded. Uh, in particular, the inner rooms had neither daylight nor natural ventilation. One of the things that's important to remember is that while the structure of the house had a kind of capacity to hold this increased density, it's really the alley structure of the compound that was critical to the shifting use of the Shikamun house and also in its shift from single extended family compounds to multifamily. As is common to the Chinese courtyard house, the Lilong fabric is organized in alternation of houses, then alleyway, houses, and then another alleyway. This is very different from um, Western dwelling fabrics, or in this case, this is San Francisco, in which we typically arrange um, housing to in front the street, so if we have a street here, houses are arranged and flipped so that they are in fronting the street, and then we have backyards facing backyards. So you end up with two rows of housing between every lane of access. In the Chinese urban fabric, solar orientation of the dwelling fabric takes priority, so units are organized toward the sun. If we now look back at this section, what you can see is that the biggest change is probably where the front door is. Um, if you look at this, the way the house was designed, it was intended to be seen as one unit in which you entered from the south. Instead, again, if you remember that this is only one room wide, in order to get, if someone's just occupying the front room, how is it that you get to all the other rooms? Well, what happened in the Lilong, because you have alley house, alley structure, is that a majority of the people are now using the north service door as their main door to go in and out so that the community, instead of being t tied that way, is mostly living this way and moving into the alley here. The Leelong had a unique capacity to support a diversity of ways of living, singles, couples, and families in non-related patterns, as well as extended families. As I mentioned early, by the, earlier, by the end of the 1940s, in a span of 70 years, more than 72% of Shanghai was covered in the Lilong fabric. And while I'm not a formal determinist, I don't think it's an accident that the changing ideal of a modern Shanghainese family paralleled the proliferation of the Lilong and its anti unanticipated uses. The Lilong compounds contribute uh, to the unique legibility of modern Shanghai. In this particular diagram, the Li Long are shown in gray. Now I want you to imagine that each yellow bar here shows an alley. It's important to remember 
that on any one of these yellow lines, there's anywhere from 200 to 300 people that are using this alley. So then when you look at this entire compound, which is the one we showed earlier, and so here's the retail area that's kind of masking the compound from the street, there are, at a low estimate, about 2,500 people that are all hidden from the streets. And that's what one of these alleys look like. Now imagine how many people are all hidden from the streets. These alleys with the 2,500 people are then collected on these north-south paths and streets, running through here. As a result, these streets hold a propensity for local shops, retail and commercial activities to service the immediate and surrounding neighborhood. These north-south local roads are then collected onto east-west arterial roads. These streets hold the city-oriented retail and commercial activities. And the thing to remember, of course, is that many of these are the formal, former canal towpaths that organized to the Huangpu. So although the Lilong are hidden, uh, the orientation, the hierarchy, the density of the Lilong are integral to how modern Shanghai functioned. My point is that Shanghai is a city with a sustained, legible urbanism that has taken centuries to form. As Shanghai now moves to making global cities, we, use we see practices that use a tabula rasa approach to the design of the city and the buildings of icons of progress without connection to the city form. At the ground level, they seem to uh, ignore the elements that organize the structure of everyday living. In Pudong, we see that our new cities are best when they're seen from afar. In Puxi, we see the destruction of the urban fabrics and the loss of the urban legibility. While China, Shanghai, continue to awe the world with their speed, size, and audacity of development, I think cities in Shanghai serve as warnings of the uh, nature of my practice, frankly, to fragment and ignore the experience of the legibility of cities. This is what's the uh, tourist map of Shanghai today which completely uh, obliterates any of the leg legibility of the city, it's the highways, a few monuments here and there. I'm not advocating for the preservation of the Lilong, but for a continued transformation rather than the obliteration of, the of Shanghai city morphology, its unique spatial traditions, variety, and clear legibility. I believe that Shanghai has the potential to lead with a new progressive urbanism in the 21st century and one that's defined by its cultural sustenance as well as material and ecological. Thank you.